Crush's Coaster is a spinning coaster at Walt Disney Studios. This ride takes the familiar Mauer SC2000 model and places it indoors with music and lighting effects, making the experience more disorienting. It is a fun ride, but be prepared to wait. This routinely is the longest way at the entire Disneyland Paris resort. Is it worth the lengthy queues? Find out in this review of Crush's Coaster. Walt Disney Studios opened back in 2002 as the second theme park at Disneyland Paris. This park was infamously rushed and open to negative reviews. Guests and Disney executives alike criticized the park's appearance and lack of attractions. The first expansion occurred in 2007 with Toon Studios. This included two new rides, most notably Crush's Coaster. While this technically was a custom Mauer spinning coaster, the main layout was an off-the-shelf clone. This was a cost and time-saving measure. Crush's Coaster's main layout is identical to the SC2000 coasters. Notable examples of these include Spider at Lagoon and Whirlwind at Seabreeze. This layout was designed for small to medium-sized parks. It had a small footprint, modest budget, and limited capacity. Even at the smaller parks, this ride routinely is the longest way at the respective parks. For example, it is not uncommon for Undertow at Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk to get hour waits and weekends. Then you have Laugh Track at Hershey Park. Considering this is one of the highest attended parks in the US, it is not surprising that Laugh Track routinely is a 60 to 90 minute wait, even on days when the other coasters have manageable waits. The capacity issue is further exasperated at Walt Disney Studios with Crush's Coaster. You have high attendance like Hershey Park, but you have far less rides to soak up the crowds. So the line routinely is 1-2 to two hours in length, and this is not a queue you want to get stuck in. A majority of the line is a sea of switchbacks devoid of theming, and it moves at a snail's pace. Each car holds just 4 riders. Pairs of riders sit back to back. I believe the coaster can run up to 10 or so trains, but it just cannot handle the demand. There is a continuously moving load platform to help the ride hit its theoretical capacity at least, but it is just so much lower than your typical Disney coaster. So how can you avoid the waits? The four best methods are early entry, single rider line, premier access, and hopping in line right before close. Early entry is an awesome perk included with the on-site hotels. You can get into Walt Disney Studios an hour early and Crush's Coaster is one of the available rides. Most visitors know about this ride's lengthy queues and they'll head there first, so it often is an hour wait for much of early entry. The key is to be one of the first people in the park. Most people seem to arrive at the front entrance exactly at the start of early entry. You want to arrive 15 to 20 minutes early so you're at the front of the pack. This should give you a short wait on Crush's Coaster. Now, because of early entry, regular park guests cannot head here right at open unless they want a lengthy wait. All of the hotel guests will already be there. The second way to get on faster is the single rider line. Typically, the wait will be shorter than the standby queue, but it will still take a decent chunk of time. There is a wait time board specifically for the single rider line, but it cannot update fast enough to reflect fluctuations in the single rider queue. A family of four can influence the wait by 10 minutes alone. So my best advice is to hop in line and visually confirm what the wait looks to be. On average, it takes about 1-2 to two minutes per person. It is a function of how many groups of three come through the main line. So if you see 20 people ahead of you, it will probably take about a half hour. The third way to get on quickly is Premier Access. This is a paid skip the line service. Premier Access Ultimate allows you to bypass the wait for all eligible rides at the resort once per day. You can enter the queue anytime you'd like. This costs you 100 to 200 euros per person depending on the day, so it's definitely a hefty cost. Alternatively, you can purchase Premier Access 1, which is a single pass for a specific ride. You book a 1 hour return window. Crush's Coaster specifically costs 13 to 18 euros per person depending on the day. I would strongly consider this approach if you don't have early entry and you want to keep your group together. The final way to bypass the wait is to hop in line right before park close. Disney tends to overestimate wait times right before closing, and there will also be no more Premier Access guests 
meaning the standby queue should move a bit faster. While the line will still be shorter than it was earlier in the day, you may still have to wait a bit. I recommend this approach if you don't have a park hopper ticket. This is because you are not sacrificing additional park time doing this. However, if you have a park hopper ticket, know that you are giving up some time at Disneyland Paris because that park is typically open later than Walt Disney Studios. With all the capacity stuff out of the way, let's talk about the actual experience. The ride's appearance is a mixed bag. The show building looks kind of weird. Part of it is designed to look like a sky blue warehouse. Then you have a mural of Crush with a different shade of blue. Then the base of the building has some rock work, which I think looks fantastic. I really wish this had been used for the entire building. The ride's entrance looks cool. It looks like a beach shack. You have a nice sign with some seagulls next to it. Then there's a pole with a spinning ride vehicle that's a really nice touch. I already mentioned a majority of the queue is downright awful to look at, but the final part indoors looks awesome. It is themed to Sydney Harbor. You have some atmospheric lighting and a nice mural on the wall. Then the operator's panel is themed to look like a snack shack, and you have some animatronic seagulls at the top who periodically yell, Last but not least, the ride's vehicles look great as well. They look like turtle shells. When it's your time to board, you can either sit facing forwards or backwards. While you will spin for the main layout, this will impact a few things earlier in the ride. If you can only ride this once, I think the visuals are slightly better going forwards during the first part, but it doesn't really matter for the rest of the ride because you'll be spinning anyway. The cars are identical to the other Mauer spinners. You have awkwardly low seats. Then you're secured by a T-bar. Legroom can be a bit cramped if you have a bag though because I'll need to ride with you. Once dispatched, you turn out of the station and have a small lift hill. You will not start spinning until later in the ride. You then have a twisting drop right that takes you outdoors. It is short, but it has a fun lateral kink at the start. This especially sneaks up on you if you're traveling backwards. You're only outside for a second or two. Then you head back indoors for the dark ride sequence through the Great Barrier Reef. I love this part, especially because the visuals differ whether you're traveling forwards or backwards. Those facing forwards will see colorful plants. Then you'll see Nemo and Squirt on TV screens ahead of you. If you're traveling backwards, the visuals are darker as you're in the deep sea. In short order, you enter a mossy green submarine and the intensity picks up. The music becomes more ominous and you encounter Bruce the Shark. At first you see him on a screen. Then you ascend a speedy lift hill and you'll have a sweet shark animatronic off to your side. It is blocked by the sub walls, so it's a nice jump scare when you finally reach it. Once you reach the top of the lift hill, you enter the area with the main layout. Before talking about the ride elements, I want to talk about the overall atmosphere. The theme is that you enter the East Australian Current, or EAC, and are being pulled along. That's a good premise for a coaster. The main room is very dark. You just have some basic lighting effects. While the visuals are not as strong as your average Disney coaster, I think it works in this case. It's like Space Mountain in my opinion how the dark helps the ride. This ride spins randomly and at a good clip, so it would be difficult to take in any set pieces or screens. There's no guarantee you'd be looking at them, and even if you were, you'd spin right past them. The dark environment makes the experience more disorienting and chaotic, as you cannot tell where you're going. And this is paired with a high-octane soundtrack that'll get your juices flowing. The elements from this point are identical to the other SC2000 coasters, which is why I'm going to show the outdoor models I've written to better illustrate what happens. The lift hill is 51 feet or 16 meters in height. Once you reach the top, your vehicle unlocks and you'll start to rotate slowly. The spinning will intensify a bit later in the ride. You start with a slow hairpin turn and a straightaway. Because you're in the darkness on Crush's coaster, it builds suspense for the first drop. This is a large swooping drop. It has a great zip to it. And if you take it backwards, you get a bit of a free fall effect as you're pulled downwards. You then twist upwards into the first mid-course brake run. From this point forwards, you spin at a consistent rate until the very end. This is especially true if you're lucky enough to get an off-balanced vehicle. 
the cars will be fully loaded for capacity purposes, but this can be done by putting two kids on one side and two adults on the other. The hairpin turn into the mid-course brake run delivers a solid lateral jolt. Then the brakes themselves will slow the car a tad, but I don't mind because it seems to initiate a better spin. You then have a curve drop downwards. It is not nearly as wild as the first drop, as it mostly rebuilds speed. You then have a really cool horseshoe turn. This is a 90 degree turn that's ultra disorienting in the darkness, and it sort of feels like you're inverting. Then you curve upwards into another mid-course brake run. You're not slowed down here. You then have a graceful turn, followed by a slalom section. The S-bends have some light side-to-side -side motion, and the whole bit messes with your sense of direction because you're spinning throughout them. You then pass through another mid-course brake run, and then you have a downwards helix. The end of this has some mild positive Gs, and it can be pretty dizzying with a good spin. You then jump upwards into the last mid-course. You will be slowed a bit, but it seemed to increase the rate of spin. You then have one last bank drop, and then you hop up into the final brakes. These Mauer spinners are notorious for violently slamming the car back into place in the final brake run. It is a moment I always dread on these coasters. Fortunately, this has been toned down a bit on Crush's coaster. It's still jolty, don't get me wrong, but the slam is gentler. You then return to the station, ending the experience. This layout typically has 1,400 feet or 425 meters of track, but this one has more length to it because of the dark ride sequence at the start. In terms of pacing, Crush's coaster is quite good. You have the slow build on the dark ride bit at the start, then the main coaster sequence is action packed between the spinning and setting. Then this ride is fairly smooth. Some of the transitions are a little jumpy, but it's perfectly tolerable for me. So, what would I rate Crush's coaster? Ignoring capacity, this ride is a 7 out of 10. It is a lot of fun. SC2000s are solid layouts, especially if they're minimally braked and spin well. This one does both those things, and the sense of speed and disorientation is boosted by the indoor environment. The lighting and music during the main ride work well for me. Then you have some solid theming in the dark ride sequence at the start. But you have to talk about this ride's capacity. It is a major issue. The reality is that you'll likely encounter a long wait for this ride. Disney really should have built a ride with a higher throughput. Is it worth a one and a half to two hour wait? No. But this coaster is well worth experiencing if you can get on it faster using one of the methods I shared earlier. Whether it be early entry, single rider, or premier access. So those are my thoughts on Crush's coaster at Walt Disney Studios. What are your thoughts about this coaster? Whether it be the on-ride experience or wait times, let me know down in the comments. If you enjoyed this review, I would appreciate it if you gave this video a like, and you consider subscribing, because there'll be a lot more roller coaster amusement park videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.